Welcome to the weekly worship service of First Baptist Church, Middlesboro, Kentucky. Join us on this journey of faith as we join our hearts and voices as one to celebrate God's faithfulness, grace, and love. Good morning. Good morning. It's uh, wonderful to be able to take this morning and this afternoon and today and be in the spirit and the presence of our God. We're here to worship our risen Savior. Last week we were reminded that 2,000 years ago the tomb was empty and that's still the case today and that's why we are here. But before we begin to worship, let's look at our ministry opportunities. If you open your bulletin, and notice up in the right-hand corner, you'll see a column of activities in capitalized print. And these are all activities that are uh, taking place this week and this week alone. So take note of those and um, highlight any of special interest to you that you are involved with any of those committees. Oh, so 
is good to be in this <laughs> A little slow. Try good morning. Good morning. I threw that. That was an extra good morning, and you weren't ready for it. I'm sorry. It is good to be here today, and it's especially good to see you here as we've gathered for worship. We want to give you a chance to turn around and see the others that have uh, gathered in this place with you. So before we sing our opening hymn of praise with a voice of joy and with a song of triumph, let's stand and turn to those around us and greet them in the love of our risen Lord. Please be seated. This morning before we pray together, I regret to inform you of a couple of deaths that have occurred in our church yesterday and one this morning. Rudy Poor passed away yesterday and George Stapleton, one of the, our oldest church members, passed away late last evening. And so we want to pray for these families uh, who have suffered this loss this weekend. And I know there are others in our church family who have lost family this past uh, weekend who are away from us today. And so we want to remember them in our prayers also. So as we go to the Lord, let's remember these two families and also remember uh, those who are sick in our congregation as we pray. Let's pray together. Lord God, we come to you this Sunday after Easter. And although the tomb is still empty, we have returned from the Easter celebration to real life. To a life that sometimes doesn't make sense. To a life that sometimes is difficult. We pray especially today for those who've lost loved ones. For the poor family and the Stapleton family who grieve 
because one they cared for is no longer with them. And Lord, we know that the great reality of Easter is that although it's been proclaimed for 2,000 years, it is still real today. And that Easter resurrection power is available in our lives and in the lives of those who are grieving. And so we pray today that you would be very present to them. And they would know of your peace and they would know of the hope of the resurrection that comes through knowing you. We pray for those today who are in the hospital, those in our nursing homes who are watching us this morning. We pray that you would be with them, that you would give them strength this day, bring healing to their bodies. And we pray for our church. We pray that you would be with us as we worship you today. We pray that you would help us to discover our gifts and use them for your glory. We pray that we would be a people who, like Jonah, we learned this morning in Sunday school, has been called to a mission. Help us not to be reluctant, but help us to proclaim the good news. And may our lives reflect the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. I'll be reading from John 20, verses 19 through 31. It was late that Sunday evening, and the disciples were gathered together behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. Then Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. After saying this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were filled with joy at seeing the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. Thomas said to them, Unless I see the scars of the nails in his hands and put my finger on those scars and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were together again indoors, and Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Then reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop your doubting and believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Do you believe because you see me? How happy are those who believe without seeing me. In his disciples' presence, Jesus performed many other miracles, which are not written down in this book. But these have been written in order that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through your faith in him, you may have life. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one. His wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Let's stand together as we sing these words and the remaining words of the other stanzas. Hymn number 412, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. Let's stand. <laughs>
Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you with our hearts filled with praise and gratitude for your wondrous love manifested by sending your Son to die for our sins so that all who believe in him will have eternal life. Amen. Is it just me or is everybody asleep? <laughs> you have the look on your face like most people have during Sunday school. And that's about the right hour, isn't it? I thought, as I thought about this morning, of course, we're at the end of spring break. There's many families out of town. And, and of course, Easter Sunday always skews how many are here on the week afterwards because we're all packed in like we were last week. And I thought about, really, the week after Easter is kind of a letdown week. I have felt let down all week. We build up to Easter, and then somehow we kind of get let down the week afterwards. And I thought that was significant as we look at this text today, because what we really find is disciples who've heard about the empty tomb, and yet they're still struggling with believing, still afraid. When I was only three years old, I was running through the house, sliding in my sock feet on hardwood floor, as kids do, and did a baseball slide right into the corner of my mom and dad's bed. And you know what the result was? Five stitches right here. That same year, I threw a swing forward, an old metal swing on swing sets, came back and hit me in the eyebrow right here, two more stitches over my eye. At the age of six, we lived in Louisville, Kentucky, and I was sliding around again, this time on the ice outside the church, and fell and hit a railroad tie that we used to park against, and five more stitches into my eye. <laughs> 28 years old, I've learned a little bit of a lesson. Beyond falling and having stitches, I thought, it was a Saturday afternoon, a nice afternoon. I was watching a football game. I was going to settle down in the den. I decided to make a milkshake with our new food processor. Now, I didn't know that you were supposed to take the blade out of the thing before you poured it out of, 
out of the out of the food processor into the cup. So when I poured the milkshake out of the food processor, the blade came out doing this and went into my leg on its way down. Five more stitches <laughs> in my knee. And this morning, I thought, as I was getting dressed, I've even got a scar on my thumb when it got caught in an electric sander in seventh grade. I've got scars. And I try to cover them up, but I've lost my hair and I can't cover up the ones on my forehead anymore. We all have scars. Some are like mine, some are physical. You today, you're thinking right now about a scar you have from surgery or an accident when you were young and you had to get some stitches and every time you see it, it reminds you that you were ill, or that you've been hurt, physical scars. Some of us have emotional and psychological scars. Some of us are still living with the fact that we spent our days scared to death that daddy was going to come home drunk again. You don't know what's going to happen. Some of you are scarred from verbal abuse. Your parents always told you you couldn't do anything right. Some of you never heard the words, I love you, from your mom or your dad. Those physical, emotional scars that we have. Some of us have guilt and shame, not from our mom and dads or from someone else, but from something we've done that's left a scar. Something we did before we were a Christian, and it's left a scar. Or something we've done even after we've professed Christ, and we're ashamed of it. It's left a scar. And most of us do our best to hide the scars. The physical ones, we hope that our hair can hide them or our clothes can hide them, and we can somehow hide those scars from others. And we do our best to hide our emotional and psychological scars. It's real interesting when you look at families that are dysfunctional. Many times their children overachieve and overexcel as a way of overcoming the scars of their own childhood. We have scars. And so did the resurrected Lord. When we look at John 20, 19 through 31, we find the interesting story of Jesus coming to the 12 in the upper room. It's the same afternoon of the resurrection, the same evening. And Mary has come back and told the disciples what has occurred, and John and Peter have run to the tomb to see for themselves, and now they're all up in the upper room trying to determine what has happened. The doors are locked because they're afraid of the Jews. That is, they're afraid that it's going to happen to them. They may be, the, may be the next ones on the cross. They're already scarred from the event, and fear grips their lives. And Scripture says that Jesus came into the room and stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. George Beasley Murray said, This is the ultimate Easter greeting. God's peace be with you. To their fear and to their anxiety, he spoke the word shalom. That means more than peace, but completeness and wellness and wholeness, everything that's good in life, be with you. And Jesus gives them that blessing, and then he does something odd. He shows them his hands and his side. That doesn't fit here, does it? I mean, the cross has occurred and death has occurred and the tomb has been experienced, but, but Jesus is risen, and we celebrated that last week. Christ is alive. He's in a glorified body. And he's got scars. What in the world is the resurrected, glorified Jesus Christ doing with scars? Shouldn't that have taken care of itself? Should there be scars on the resurrected Lord? And when we're honest with ourselves, that's bothersome. That's bothersome to us. But it's also very comforting. Why did the resurrected Lord have scars? Let me suggest three reasons. First of all, he wanted the disciples to know it was him. In the tale of the Odyssey, Odysseus, after all of his wandering, comes back home. He comes back and no one recognizes him because he's an old man, disguised as an old man. His wife and his son do not recognize him. And the tale goes that an old aged nurse begins to bathe this stranger, this old stranger who's visiting with him, and as she bathes them, she thinks she's bathing an old stranger who stopped into the village. But she notices a scar on Odysseus. And she never realized it was Odysseus. 
till she saw his scar. And our scars identify us, whether they're physical or even emotional. You know, when you really get to know someone, or especially if you're a deacon or a pastor and you're dealing with families, you know what they tell you about? The scarring moments. That's how we identify ourselves. Those difficult moments we've gone through that have left scars and has, they've molded us and made us who we are, and we identify ourselves by scars. The same is true of Jesus. He wants his disciples to know that it's him. So he shows them his scars. Now, it's a strange text here because when he comes back to Thomas, who wasn't there the first time, he tells Thomas, put your finger into the nail prints and put your hand into my side if that's what it's going to take. Not only look at the scars, experience the scars. Now, why that's strange is because earlier in another chapter, when Mary Magdalene has encountered Jesus there in the garden of the tomb and she grabs a hold of Jesus, Jesus says to her, let go of me, don't touch me. So why do we have this differing idea of Jesus' glorified body? Why to one follower does he say, don't touch me? And to another he says, touch me. Because his whole purpose in both of those encounters is that the disciple will believe. With Mary Magdalene, the problem was not that Jesus was resurrected. The problem was that she wanted to hang on to the earthly Jesus. She just thought it was Jesus living again. She had not completely understood that something special had taken place. This wasn't just her earthly friend Jesus. This was the glorified risen Lord. But the problem with Thomas is the other side. Thomas has to be convinced that that is the earthly Jesus that just came through that locked door and is standing among them. Thomas has to be convinced he's not seeing a ghost or an aberration or it's not the figment of his imagination. Jesus wants Thomas to understand that it's me, Thomas, the historical Jesus, the one who ate and drank with sinners and touched the leper's skin, the one who had a mom and dad in Nazareth and worked in the carpenter shop, the one who blessed you and blessed so many others, the one who was crucified. It's me, Thomas. It's me. And Christians throughout the centuries have done a good job trying to keep those in a balance. Jesus is not someone who appeared to be human but became human. He's all, he was fully human and fully God. And even here in these resurrection stories, we find Jesus trying to get that point across to his disciples. It's me, the historical Jesus, and I really died and now I have really triumphed over death. So he showed them his scars so they would know it was him. Do you think he showed them his scars not only so they would know it was him, but so they would know it was him when they saw him again? Jesus says to us that what we do to the least of these that surround us, we do to him. Do you think in a very real way that when you and I care for those who are scarred, that is, emotionally, spiritually, physically, we're seeing Jesus again. He wants us to realize that. He showed them his scars so that they would know it was him. He showed them his scars so we'll know it's him when we see those who are hurting. And we can say, that's Jesus, and I'm called to minister to that person. He showed them his scars to remind them that a healing had taken place. If you look in Webster Dictionary, you discover this definition of a scar. It is a mark left by a burn or a wound that has healed. It's a mark that has healed. A scar is a reminder that a healing has taken place. When I think about the scars on my forehead, I am reminded I'm no longer bleeding and I no longer need medical attention. It's been healed. When you think of a mark from a surgery and a scar from a surgery, you're not reminded that you still have a problem. You're reminded that God through physi a physician has intervened in your life and you've been healed. What is wrong has been made right. That's why Jesus showed his scars, to remind them that a healing had taken place. And that healing was the cross of Calvary. You and I are guilty in our sins. But as we are reminded every time we have the Lord's Supper that Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. 
He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. He showed them his scars to remind them the cross had taken place. A healing had occurred. And it reminds us of something else, that there's no avoiding the cross. Even the resurrection of Jesus doesn't erase the reality of the cross. Now, there are a lot of us who want to do away with the cross and avoid the cross aspect of Christianity. We really don't like the teachings of Jesus that we have to take up a cross. We want a more convenient faith, one that doesn't require so much of us, one that where we can go to church on Sunday morning and feel good about ourselves and feel good about our life and somehow escape the troubles of life, at least for one hour a week. Back in the early 80s, the band Huey Lewis and the News, and who knows what happened to them. They're kind of one-hit wonders, aren't they? But they sang a song, I Want a New Drug. And the whole idea was, I want something that can last, something that will make my life worthwhile. And church has become that for many people. Void of the cross, void of the struggle of Christianity, it's become a simple drug to get away from life for a while. But there's no escaping the suffering of the cross and the bearing of the cross if we're going to live authentic Christian lives. We just can't understand that. How come when I profess Christ, everything doesn't just magically fall into place? Why when I'm trying to serve God, do I struggle with sin? Do I still get ill? Do the people I love still die? Why does that happen? The cross. If the resurrection did not erase the scars of Jesus, why do we think that salvation is going to erase ours? Remember what they are. They're a reminder that a healing has taken place. And so when all those bad memories and all those hurtful sorrows come to our minds when we find ourselves in events that remind us of sorrowful times, remember they're there for a reason. They're there to remind you that a healing has taken place in your life that God has empowered you to move through those moments. Physicians tell us that scar tissue is what? Stronger than the original. A scar is a reminder that we've grown stronger in some way. We've moved beyond that, that first initial wound. And God has blessed us and changed us. He showed them his scars so they'd be reminded that a healing had taken place. But most importantly, he showed them his scars so they would believe. He simply told Thomas, touch them. Put your hand into my side that you will believe. He wanted them to believe. There's a story about a woman who was assaulted in her own backyard one day. And through the love of a loving husband and a good counselor and a pastor in a church, she's come a long way to overcoming the, the fear and anxiety and the scars of being assaulted in her own home. Her counselor told her it would be a good idea if you shared your experience with someone. Someone besides the pastor or someone besides your counselor or your husband. Share it with someone. So she thought, who should I share my experience with? Well, obviously, we first think, well, maybe she should share her experience with someone else who's been assaulted. I mean, help another young woman overcome her anxiety and her fear and her scarring. But she decided, she told her pastor, to tell Joe Smith about it. And the pastor said, Joe Smith, why do you want to tell Joe Smith about your incident? And she said, you know, Joe Smith is a struggling alcoholic. He's a Christian, but he really struggles with alcohol. And he can't seem to overcome it. And Joe Smith knows what it's like to go to hell and live through it. So I'm going to share my scar with Joe Smith. You know, in a very real way, when you and I share and show our scars healing comes to other people we like to hide them we don't want anybody to see them and lots of times no one does do you know what people see when they watch this broadcast on Sunday morning or they see you leave here and go out to eat after church they see well dressed well kept people who seem to have it all together who can stand up every Sunday and sing like there's nothing wrong in the world and you know what they say to themselves I couldn't go there I've got scars. I've got wounds. I've got sins. Their God wouldn't accept me, and I don't think they would either. Maybe you and I need to learn to show our scars. 
Maybe we need to realize that by sharing our scars and how God has healed our souls, some others might believe. This is a strange text. The resurrected Lord has scars. And he showed them to them. So they would know it was him. They would recognize him. So they would be reminded that the cross was a place of healing so that they would believe. I encourage you this week, think of someone who needs you to show them your scars. Let's pray together. God, in our minds today, we have many memories, many hurtful moments that have scarred us. Keep us going back and reliving those moments. For some today, it's a very painful time. For some, every time they come into this church building, they're reminded of a hurtful time, and it's painful even to come to worship. But Lord, help us to be people who are like you, who take those scarring moments and turn them into glory, who take those scarring events and share them with others that they too might believe that God is alive and is powerful and is victorious over death and the grave. Help us to be people who are not afraid to share ourselves, even the deep recesses of ourselves with others, if that's what it takes for them to know you as Lord. We pray today for those who are here and the scar tissue is not healed yet. They come today with open wounds in their lives, still hurting, wounds that are festering from guilt and shame and pain. And we pray today that this might be a time of healing for them, that it would be scarred over, that it would be cared for, and that the reminder of those events would only be there to remind them of how you've intervened and how they've gotten stronger. Lord Jesus, move in each of our lives this morning and help us to be people as you are. Thank you, Lord, for even in resurrection, for identifying with our woundedness and our hurting. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn response is 318, The Nail-Scarred Hand. As you turn there this morning, let me issue this invitation to you. If you've never accepted Christ, this is a wonderful day to do that. Come and profess him as Savior and Lord. Follow him in believer's baptism. Know today that you too have believed in the one who has the nail-scarred hands. Others today may have something in their life that has been <clears throat> bothering them and hurting them for years and years. Maybe during this time of response, you want to spend that time asking God to heal you of whatever it is that's hurting you and that continues to hurt your life. And still others might want to even come publicly and rededicate their life or come publicly and have prayer that God is moving in their life and that they can move on and use hurtful events to bring others to Christ. Others may want to come and join the church because we discover that we go through difficult times, even like families this morning in our church are going through, and we need each other, and you need a place to belong. So you come and join the church if God's leading you to do that this morning. As we stand and sing, I'll be at the front as you come. Let's stand and sing hymn number 318. Good morning. This is Jeff Roberts, pastor of the First Baptist Church of Middlesboro, Kentucky. I am so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today through our Sunday morning broadcast. We hope each week that you are blessed by God, encouraged in the faith, and challenge to live your life with a deeper commitment to and a relationship with God through God's Son, Jesus Christ. For nearly 20 years, our morning worship service has been broadcast as an outreach ministry to our city, and we are glad to provide this ministry to you. However, we at First Baptist do not believe that there is a substitute for being with God's people in God's house for worship. So if you are new in our city, or if you currently do not attend one of our other wonderful churches in the Middlesboro area, we invite you to worship with us in person next week. Our Sunday school begins at 945, 
and there you will find Bible study and fellowship for all ages. It is followed by our morning worship service at 11 a.m. First Baptist Church is located at 23rd and Cumberland in downtown Middlesbrough. If we can minister to you or if you would like more information concerning our many exciting ministries at First Baptist, feel free to write us or call us at our church office during our regular office hours. Until next week, it is our prayer that you might know the transforming love of God and the peace that comes through relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ. Please be seated. Today is a difficult day for us as a church and a special day in that today is Mark's last Sunday with us. As most of you know, I think by now that Mark has accepted the call as Minister of Music and Senior Single Adult Coordinator at the Manassas Baptist Church in Manassas, Virginia, outside Washington, D.C. And uh, as I said uh, last week uh, on Easter, that uh, Mark and I have been friends for a long time. And I'm very excited for Mark and his, this opportunity. It's a wonderful, Manassas is a wonderful church. And uh, I think he's going to do an excellent job for them. And we'll be praying for him as he makes that move. But we want to do something special for him today. Uh, this afternoon, of course, you're invited to reception in honor of Mark and Margaret and their family from 4 to 6. We'll be in the fellowship hall and our social committee is, uh, have a wonderful social plan for us. And hope you'll come this afternoon and do that. We're encouraging you to bring a card and if you feel led to uh, also give a love gift as part of that card that you give to Mark and Margaret to help them in their moving expenses. And so we hope that you'll come to do that this afternoon. But we have a couple of special things this morning we want to present to Mark and, uh, and wanted you to be a part of that. So Mark, why don't you come up here and stand to receive, <laughs> as it were. And we'll go first with, uh, who wants to go first? What? Gypsy's going first. Our choir president, Gypsy Bilar, has a presentation to make to Mark. the adult choir, we offer an expression of our appreciation to you for your leadership in the music ministry the past three years at our church. We pray God's continued blessing upon your life and ministry for him. And this is a gift of appreciation from the handbell choir. Is it a belt? <laughs> no. <laughs> You'll make a speech. <laughs> Thank you. It has been. Uh, do you need to open it now? Or? Oh yeah, you can open it. Okay. I will. Uh, as I impromptu speech, I will. I will ad lib and uh, fill in some time as I open up the. Uh, It's going to take me a week to read all these notes and names in here. That's about it. They need to check out a bigger card. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you all very much. This is from the Bells. And, uh, now that's a, a unique group. <laughs> it's a great group. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It has been a, uh, a very good three years for me, a good experience, and uh, I thank you uh, very much for your love and your prayers for these three years, and I leave with confidence that you will continue to support and to pray for us as we make this move and this transition. There it comes. They're making wrapping paper better these days. <laughs> this may take a while, folks. Oh. Now I 
I will never be late for choir rehearsal. <laughs> Thank you. I'll sit right on my desk and I'll be able to know exactly what time I want to challenge you that you, you can find that on your desk in Manassas. <laughs> We've got an ongoing joke about Mark's filing system. <laughs> what there is of it. Thank you. Stay right, stay right here. Let's, let's all stand. What we want to do that today is, is to send Mark off with our prayers. And I do encourage you to be here this afternoon from 4 to 6 so you can speak a personal word to him and to Margaret and the kids and to remember him in prayers. He'll be here most of this, most this, of this week. week as they're preparing to move because I don't think where their movie's going to be ready for a week or so. And so you can drop by the house even this week and uh, help him pack. Yeah, especially play. if you want to help pack. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we want to pray for Mark, and then we'll sing our, our chorus that we have, uh, God be with you, till we meet again. But we want to offer a special prayer on Mark's behalf today. So let's pray together. God, we come today with great mixed emotions. As we think of our time with Mark's ministry the past three years, Lord, we are excited for him and the opportunities that lie ahead. But any time that someone leaves that has spent life with us, it's a difficult moment. And we pray that you would be with him and Margaret and Hannah and Zachary. We thank, pray that you would give them safe passage to Manassas. That you would watch over him during this time of transition and moving. That you would prepare the church for his leadership there. And Lord, we pray that you would use him in mighty ways. That you would use him to help others use their gifts of music to worship you and to bring others to Christ. We thank you for him and his life, his integrity, his love for you, his love for your church. We thank you, Lord, that you are using him and that many years ago he saw his gifts and all of his talent that he has as a gift from you to be returned to you. For this witness, we give thanks and pray that you will be with him. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church this morning. It's good to see you as we've gathered together to worship our Lord. If you're visiting with us, we encourage you to fill out the visitor's card that's attached to your morning worship service bulletin and to place in the offering plate a little later in the service. There's also a card in the pew rack if you choose to use that. You can place it in the offering plate or you can also uh, give it to one of the ministers as you leave this morning. Also, you'll notice on that same card is a decision card. At the end of our service, we always have an opportunity for you to respond publicly, but if you choose to fill out the decision card in your bulletin, you can place that in the offering plate or hand it to one of the ministers as you leave. We're glad that you're here this morning as we've come to worship our Lord. Let me draw your attention to just a few announcements. First of all, this Wednesday evening is our monthly covered dish meal and business meeting. We encourage everyone to obviously bring some food with you and to come and enjoy the fellowship at 6 o'clock. I always encourage everyone that if you're not a normal Wednesday night attender, you should try to at least come this one Wednesday night every month because it's an opportunity to get to know people in your church and to share that fellowship and also for you to have the opportunity to participate in the decision making of the church. So I encourage you to be here this Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock. On Thursday, we're having a trip to the Dogwood Arts Festival. We're leaving at 9 o'clock. We have one van full. We take the Rebecca Sunday School class every year, but we have another van that's empty and waiting for anyone of any age to join us. So if you'd like to go, call the church office this week or just show up at 9 o'clock on Thursday morning and join us for the Dogwood Arts Festival trip. We go to Market Square Mall. We go to Calhoun's on the River to eat, and then we go look at some of the beautiful trails. So... Uh, all of those are wonderful times of fellowship. I hope you'll join us this coming Thursday. Those of you who are in Sunday school this morning received a questionnaire for needs assessment, and I hope that you took the time to fill that out for me. If you were not in Sunday school this morning, you want to participate in this questionnaire, I encourage you to do that. You can pick one of these up at the back of the sanctuary this morning. They'll be available the next two weeks for you to fill out, and you can drop it by the church office or hand it to me when you filled it out. What this is, is this is the beginning of my Doctor of Ministry project. So I need your input. It's a preaching project, and we're going to be discussing the pastoral needs of the church and the ability to minister through the pulpit to those pastoral care needs. So if you've not filled one of these out, I encourage you to participate in this church-wide questionnaire, and you can pick one up, as I said, at the back of the sanctuary. We're glad that you're here this morning. We want to give our members a chance to greet our guests and also to greet one another. So we're going to stand and greet one another and then sing our fellowship song, There is a Savior. Let's stand and greet one another. sing that again, Herman. I think that's a little new to everybody. Let's sing it one more time, okay? There is a
seated. Hear our call to worship this morning from Psalm 66. Shout with joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. Come and see what God has done, how awesome his works are on your behalf. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come let us rejoice in him. Praise our God, O peoples, and let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives. He keeps our feet from slipping. Come and listen, all you who fear God, and let me tell you what God has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would have not listened. But God has surely listened and heard my voice in prayer. Praise be to God who did not reject me in my prayer or withhold his love from me. This is the word of God. Please join with me in prayer. Precious God, we just come to you this morning asking you to open our hearts and open our spirits to your presence. Allow us to feel you moving amongst us. Help us just to be renewed through your presence here. Lord, may we leave this place this morning different than when we came, with different attitudes, with different outlooks, and ready for a week of service to you. May we begin this process of opening up through the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand as we sing our hymn of praise, hymn number 16, O Worship the King. children join me here at the front I think
think our preschool groups are down a little today, but I think our children had about 30 this morning, so we should have a good group this morning. Got a few more coming in. Who are you? <laughs> I was going to ask you this morning, and I've already talked to some of you during Sunday school, to tell me what is the most unbelievable thing you've ever seen. Does anybody want to share something or some? Okay, Elizabeth. You'd like to see somebody disappear. <laughs> Have you ever seen someone disappear? You got a few people you'd like to disappear? Okay. Tyler? A guy jumping off a cliff. The most unbelievable thing you've ever seen. Neil? A guy pulled six locomotives with his teeth. That is amazing. You got one more, Elizabeth. Some man pulling a bus. You two, you two have been watching too much TV. You know. <laughs> Y'all must have seen the same show now. You think so? Pulling that locomotive in that bus. Did you see that on TV? Well, somebody, I With their back. Okay. Anybody else seen? What about a magician trick? You ever seen a big magician trick? Yeah. What, what have you seen? Um, when I went to the magic show, I saw him almost got hurt by needles. He almost got hurt by needles. He laid on needles. Sometimes we see things that are just unbelievable. Just can't believe it. And we see it, and, and yet, even though we can't believe it, we know we've seen it. We've, we've witnessed it. Today, during the church service, for those who will remain during the worship, that's what the sermon's going to be about. It's entitled, I Don't Believe It. And it talks about the time when Jesus appeared to all of his disciples after his resurrection. And it says that Jesus came through the locked doors and he stood there among them and the disciples looked at Jesus and they didn't know what to believe. They couldn't believe that he was alive again, but they were witnessing it. In fact, the scripture says that they disbelieved, that is, they didn't believe it because they were so excited from joy and amazement. We think about those few people that saw Jesus after the resurrection and said, golly, I just don't believe this. This is amazing. This is wonderful that this has occurred. And in that small little place with that small little group, now the great news that Jesus is alive has spread all over the world. I brought our globe this morning, and I was looking here, over here where Israel is and where Jerusalem is. It's way over here. Over in here is Jerusalem, right in that little bitty place right there. And that's where Jesus died and rose again from that one little spot here we are way over here in Kentucky but we're just one of the many people that have heard all over the world from that one little spot with those few people that found it hard to believe that day the message that Jesus Christ is alive has spread and I thought what a wonderful thing that is for us you know sometimes it's hard for us to understand what the Bible says. It's hard for us to understand how Jesus died and then, he's, and he rose again. But you know what we call that? We call that faith. Believing that when things are impossible with us, they're possible with God. Do you believe it's possible that from that one little group way over here that all the world has heard that Jesus is alive? That sounds impossible, but it's possible with God. And get this, if you would be willing to share what God has done in your life with your friends, it's possible that they would believe too. Let's have a word of prayer. God, we thank you for your word that tells us that wonderful story of how Jesus died for our sins, but more than that, how he rose again, that we could have eternal life and that we could share that wonderful life with others. I thank you for all the children of our church, for those who've already placed their faith in you and have accepted you as Savior and Lord, been baptized as a symbol of their belief in you. And I pray that you would use them and their testimony to their friends that they might believe. 
And even now, as you're working in the hearts of many of the others in our church, we pray that you would take the faith of these children and you would build upon it, that the day would come that they too might profess you as Savior and Lord. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful reality of the resurrection that amazes us and surprises us that you love us that much. Thank you that when things were impossible with us, they're, they're very possible with you. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can go back to your seats. Okay, would you please join with me for the scripture reading this morning to follow up on what Jeff just told the children there on where Jesus appears to the disciples. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. <coughs> Excuse me. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the laws of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Face to face. 
Thank you, Kim. That was, that was wonderful. Okay, um, our hymn of testimony today is number 547. If you'll please stand with us as we sing, I Stand Amazed in the Presence. <laughs> grateful to have this another opportunity to worship you on this another Lord's Day and as we come to this time now to honor you with our tithes and offerings we ask that you bless all those that can give and those who cannot Lord continue now to be with us through your Holy Spirit during the remainder of this service for it's your name we pray amen
appreciate Suzanne filling in on our behalf during our interim period here at the church with our Minister of Music resignation the past few weeks. I'm glad that we have someone of her talent who can step right in into our music ministry and help us. And we appreciate Suzanne immensely. Consider what you would do this afternoon if you went home, lay down on your den couch or got in your easy chair and lulled yourself to sleep and the doorbell rang, interrupting your nice nap. You got up and reluctantly went to the door to find out who had interrupted your peaceful afternoon. And when you open the door, you're surprised to find lights and cameras all glaring at you and there's a man standing there with this big cardboard piece of paper that says $10 million and has your name on it. What would your reaction be? <laughs> that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> Most of the time when we see people like that, their reactions is about the same. They began dancing and screaming, I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. Because there's a conflict of two emotions all at one time. In their minds, they're thinking, this kind of thing doesn't happen to me or people I know. And at the same time, they're faced with the reality that it has happened to them. And so they must come to grips with this idea of believing. Sweepstake winners are some of our best examples of people who disbelieve for joy. You ever see a child who uh, sees a magician do a little sleight of hand? A quarter disappears, and their eyes light up. Conflict of emotions. That's not humanly possible for a quarter to disappear into thin air, but they've seen it, and they're trying to deal with believing it, and they disbelieve for joy. And that's the reaction described here in Luke 24. We're still in the upper room, just like we were last week. And the event of the resurrection has occurred. The women have been to the tomb and encountered Jesus. They've, Mary has come back and told the disciples what she is supposed to tell them. Peter and John have run to the tomb to see for themselves. They've returned to the upper room. Luke even includes a, an account of two other followers on the road to Emmaus encountering the risen Lord and sharing bread with him. And so here we find the disciples all in the upper room still trying to make sense of what has occurred and what really has happened. They're dealing with this great conflict. They're dealing with this conflict of emotions. There's the rational mind that says this. They say, this could not really have happened. What do you think the women really saw? What do you think the two followers on the road to Emmaus really experienced? I mean, we know Jesus talked about resurrection, but people just don't come back from the dead. But at the same time, they keep hearing story after story, and they've seen the linens, and they've seen the cloth, and they've witnessed the empty garden tomb, and there's a conflict of emotions. And it's just this point that Jesus appears to his disciples there in the upper room, and he comes to them and says, Why do doubts continue to rise in your mind? Look at my hands and look at my feet, the scars that we talked about last week. He said, Don't you see that a ghost doesn't have bones and flesh like me? And he took some fish and ate it with them so that they would see that he was no ghost, he was no figment of their imagination. He wanted them to believe. Just like last week, we discussed that Jesus wanted them to understand he was no ghost. He was someone that had come back from the dead. He was the historical Jesus, crucified, and now resurrected. And he showed them himself so they would believe. But look at their response in verse 41. They still did not believe because of amazement and joy. Other translations say they disbelieved because of joy. The conflict of emotions. At first they didn't believe because of doubt. How could this happen? And now, after experiencing the risen Lord, they did not believe because of amazement and joy. But it was real. It had happened. God had surprised them again, and Jesus, the resurrected one, stood before them, and they had to deal with the fact that Christ was alive. How could they now not believe? So they stood in amazement. 
and stood with a feeling of joy and disbelief. When was the last time you can recall being overwhelmed with unexpected joy? You know, the way we order our lives really doesn't leave any room for it, does it? We schedule our lives, we monitor our lives minute by minute, we make sure that there's no place for unexpected events. We want our lives void of anything unexpected. We're harried, we're, we're harassed, we're stressed, we're hurried. We don't have time for unexpected joy. We hope someday that we can put a little time aside each week to have some quiet time or maybe a little fun, but, but not a surprise, not unexpected joy. According to the church liturgical calendar, calendar today is jubilant Sunday, joyful Sunday. It's the day that's set aside every year by the church to remind ourselves that joy has come, that God has done something unexpected in our lives. Leave it to the church to plan their own surprise. We program ourselves to the point that we become void of faith in God's unexpected events in our lives. You know, when we're honest with ourselves, this is probably the last place we really think we're going to encounter joy in something unexpected. We think we encounter those moments when we see family and friends we've not seen in years, or when some wonderful event occurs in our lives, or when our children say something comical or do something out of the ordinary. Those are those moments of unexpected joy and surprise. But we really don't expect to be surprised in church. This morning you got up and you threw your clothes on hurriedly because you had overslept. You fought with the kids about what they were going to wear. You threw them in the car. You got them, in the, got them going down the street. And on the way down the street, you were looking over your Sunday school lesson in case someone asked you to read the scripture today. And you were making your way to church. On your way to church, you happened to see someone taking a leisurely walk with their dog or watering their flowers. And for a moment you were envious. You thought, you know, I wish I could spend Sunday morning with a leisurely walk with my dog or, or staying in bed or reading the paper or watering my flowers. But you can't, can you? Because you've experienced the risen Christ and you know that your week would not be complete without gathering with God's people and worshiping. So you come on. But you don't really expect to find something unexpected, some surprise, some type of joy during worship. It's like one old pastor said, he would like for something to happen in church that wasn't written in the order of worship. We crave something unexpected in our lives. We want that type of joy that's vibrant, and we seek it. And yet sometimes the church has become a place where it's the last place it can be found. Leonard Sweet writes these words, Church should be a place where we should expect to be shaken by the God's power and our feet tickled by the good news. But the church has become stodgy instead of scintillating. We are cerebral instead of celebrating. We're respectable instead of rambunctious. We've trudged along the well-worn path of predictability for so long that the church is operating with what he calls a dangerously high delight deficiency. Where is our delight in the Lord? If we look to Scripture, we find several examples of God delighting in his servants and them delighting in God. When our Lord Jesus came up from the baptismal waters, what did the thunderous voice from heaven say? This is my son in whom I delight. Jesus said the day will come that we'll stand before God and he will say to some, depart from me because I do not know you. And to others he will say, come into my kingdom. Well done, my good and faithful servant. I delight in you and we delight in God. We were created to delight in our Lord God. But we've lost that idea in the church. Business consultant Tom Peters recently wrote a book entitled The Pursuit of Wow, Every Person's Guide to a Topsy-Turvy Time. And in that book, he describes corporations that will emerge and make it in the next century. He says the key is the wow-wow philosophy. To live your life with wow means to live your life to the fullest to unleash what he calls the powers of the universe in your own life, to live life at full throttle. 
And we as Christians every week proclaim that Jesus Christ gives abundant life. We would argue today that life in Christ is the fullest life. That's living your life in its most complete state. We talk about being wowed. The pastor of the largest disciples of Christ Church in the United States said Jesus lived with wow. His wow revealed that God was a good news God and not a bad news God. He wowed the people because he revealed that God accepted people and did not push them away. He wowed people because he revealed that God picked people up out of their mistakes instead of rubbing their noses in their mistakes. He wowed people because he, they discovered that God loved them and he was no one to be feared. And in our text today, God wows the disciples and wows us again that Jesus Christ who was dead is now a living again and he has promised not only to be present to these disciples, but to you and me, and to give us eternal life. Wow. That's wonderful. That's surprising joy. Why aren't we wowed by God anymore? Why do we not stand amazed in his presence? I think sometimes we know we should, and we know there are reasons in our lives that we should, but we take God for granted. Let me remind you of four things this morning while you should stand amazed in God's presence and praise him while you might even disbelieve for joy we read Psalm 66 earlier as our call to worship and there the psalmist reveals to us these reasons he begins by proclaiming that God should be praised for all his awesome deeds his power is so great he says so great that his enemies cringe in his presence and then he goes on to say that we should stand amazed in God's presence because God has created us. The very fact that you and I live and breathe is a fact for celebration. There was a man named John Crabtree who was a Vietnam veteran. He had been wounded in the war, and he was disabled. And every, year, every month he received a disability check from the federal government. Well, one day the checks just stopped coming out of the blue. Instead, he got a letter that announced that the checks had been discontinued because he was dead. Of course, Mr. Crabtree was somewhat surprised by this news. He took, the, took his letter and wrote another letter back to the Veterans Administration trying to prove that he was very much alive. Well, federal red tape, no one believed him. He made phone calls to people. Listen, I'm still alive. Continue my checks. No response. Finally, a local television station uh, did a human interest story on John. And John was asked by the reporter, what do you make of all this? He says, well, I'm kind of frustrated. Have you ever tried to prove to someone that you're alive? Some of us don't offer a whole lot of proof that we're alive. We're predictable. We're busy. We just don't have time to be alive. I'm not talking about breathing and your, your heart still beating. I'm talking about being alive to people and to God. Tony Campano tells a story of asking his sociology class, how long have you been alive? Have you lived? And the students raise their hands and say, 20 years, 21 years, 18 years. He said, no, I'm not talking about how long has it been since you were born. I'm talking about how long have you been alive? Have you really come to understand God's presence in your life and that God is alive with you and you've really taken in what's going on around you. And one 18-year-old spoke up and said, well, Dr. Capallo, if you put it that way, maybe five or six minutes. Being alive. And the psalmist says, we should stand amazed, disbelieve out of joy. How long has it been since you just thought to yourself, I am fearfully and wonderfully made by God, the creator of the universe. Psalmist continues and said, we should be wowed for God has delivered us. He writes, look what God has done on our behalf. He has taken the sea and departed it and they walked across on dry land, recalling the exodus event of his own people. God has delivered us and so we should be wowed. God has delivered you, many of you, can recall the moments in your life when you were delivered. The time that you heard the word cancer and they were talking about you and you faced your own mortality. That time that 
emergency surgery saved your life. That time you stayed up all night long praying for your child who had 105 temperature and you prayed to God, I'll do anything if this temperature and fever will just break. When the creditors were at the door and you prayed, God, I can't pay my debts and you received a gift or got a new job or got a raise and paid your financial debts. God has delivered you over and over and over again. And we forget that, don't we? Do you remember your faith in that moment? Do you remember the promises you made to God at that time? We stand amazed in God's presence. We disbelieve out of joy because he has delivered us. But more than that, the psalmist continues, he preserves us. Last week in Baptist studies on Sunday nights, we talked about the perseverance of the saints, and we talked about how that's really a poor word, perseverance of the saints. What we need is perseverance of the saints, that God, who saved us by his grace, preserves us in his grace and keeps us from falling away. Do you remember the time in your life as a young person, or maybe not that long ago, when you walked down the aisle and rededicated your life to Christ during a revival meeting? And you know what you were amazed about? You were amazed that God took you back. You were amazed that God welcomed you like that prodigal father story and took you back and ran out to meet you and forgave you of your sins. That God had preserved your very salvation and not turned away from you. The psalmist writes, Come and listen, all who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. He has preserved our very lives and kept our feet from slipping. And then he goes on and says, In my sin, he did not reject me or withhold his love from me. That's the most amazing part. In my sin, he did not reject me or withhold his love from me. In our rebellion, in our brokenness, in all of our broken promises, in all of our good intentions, he did not reject us or withhold his love from us. No wonder you and I can stand up in the middle of a worship service and sing, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful our song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is our Savior's love for me and you. Scripture reminds us as we went through Lent that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In my sin, he did not reject me or withhold his love for me. No wonder the psalmist said, come and praise him and stand amazed in his presence. Have you been reminded this morning that God created you? that God has delivered you throughout moments in your life, that God has preserved your very salvation, that the day will come when you will see him face to face, that the Lord God loved us so much that in our sin he did not reject us or withhold his love, but instead sent love in Jesus Christ to die for our sins, that we could have salvation and eternal life. I hope this morning as you reflect on the words of the psalmist that as we stand and sing here in just a moment, you might be like a sweepstakes winner. You might be like 11 disciples in an upper room. You might just stand back and say, I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. Let's pray together. Lord, we become so predictable in our faith. We take your love for granted. And God, thank you that even when we take you for granted, you're still there. But every now and then, we read sections of Scripture like this morning, and we recall the wonderful amazement of what you have done. Things that seem impossible to us become possible with you. And so we pray today that you might break through each of our lives, that in a very new way, you might renew our faith this morning that we might stand back in awe and amazement and with praise and see all that you've done for us. That as even we stand and sing to respond to your love to us, we might do so with worship and praise and awe.
I pray today that for those who are here who need to place their faith in you for the first time, who need to believe the unbelievable, that they would find the conviction and the power and the courage to do that this morning. Dear Lord, thank you for coming back to life for us. Thank you for walking with us, for preserving us, for delivering us, for saving us. In Jesus' name. Our hymn of response is 411, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. As you turn there this morning, let me issue this invitation to you. We ask you to come and publicly profess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. If you've never done that, this is the day to do that. Trust Jesus with your life. Believe what is impossible to believe. Find faith in our Lord God. You can come and do that this morning. Follow him in baptism as a symbol of your faith. Others may want to come and become a part of this congregation because this is the place God has called you to be, and we open our doors to you. Still others may want to come in a way of rededicating their own lives, knowing that I remember the promises I made. I remember the faith I used to have, and I want to be like that again. And I know God will forgive me and will restore me in relationship with him. You want to come and do that this morning? by coming forward and having prayer with me, or even right where you're at, to pray those type of prayers as we sing. We open this time for response to you. Let's stand and sing hymn 411, and I'll be at the front as you come. Good morning. This is Jeff Roberts, pastor of the First Baptist Church of Middlesboro, Kentucky. I am so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today through our Sunday morning broadcast. We hope each week that you are blessed by God, encouraged in the faith, and challenged to live your life with a deeper commitment to and a relationship with God through God's Son, Jesus Christ. For nearly 20 years, our morning worship service has been broadcast as an outreach ministry to our city, and we are glad to provide this ministry to you. However, we at First Baptist do not believe that there is a substitute for being with God's people in God's house for worship. So if you are new in our city, or if you currently do not attend one of our other wonderful churches in the Middlesboro area, we invite you to worship with us in person next week. Our Sunday school begins at 945, and there you will find Bible study and fellowship for all ages. It is followed by our morning worship service at 11 a.m. First Baptist Church is located at 23rd and Cumberland in downtown Middlesboro. If we can minister to you or if you would like more information concerning our many exciting ministries at First Baptist, feel free to write us or call us at our church office during our regular office hours. Until next week, it is our prayer that you might know the transforming love of God and the peace that comes through relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ. Instrumentalists play one more verse, and anyone during this time can spend that time praying silently to God and renewing your own faith to God this morning. Still others may want to come publicly for prayer or to come and make a public decision. We'll offer this time to you. I'll ask Herman and Janet to play as we reverently seek God. celebrate this morning one of our youth Michael McGregor has come to profess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord to follow him in bab uh, baptism and we encourage you to come by and greet her and to share your love for her we're excited for her and her decision and we know we want to undergird her as a loving church family and you'll want to be praying for Michael as she begins her new walk with Christ and being a part of First Baptist Church let me remind you of all the wonderful things going on. We're continuing our What Baptists Believe on Sunday night at 6 o'clock. encourage you to be a part of these next two weeks. 
And then the last Sunday night of this month, you saw in your bulletin, we're having a very special ending to our Sunday night services, and that is a music celebration. We're going to have all types of music. And so we encourage you to put that on your calendar as our last Sunday evening of this church year. Now let us join in singing our closing chorus, the chorus from, what is that chorus from? I Stand Amazed. <laughs>